But today I particularly want to key in on the book of, uh, or the, this one verse in Philippians. Because you see, that was the goal of the Apostle Paul. If there was ever a man who could have come to the end of his life at this point and said, Lord, I'm ready to die and go to heaven, it was Paul. And that's what he said in the first chapter of Philippians. Paul said in uh, chapter 1, verse 23, I am in a strait betwixt two. I like that. He said, I'm in a mess. I don't know whether to go this way or go this way. Both are okay. But he basically said, I'm in a strait betwixt two. I have a desire to depart and to be with, with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful of you or for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for being by my coming to you again. He had said in verse 21, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. You see, Paul had something to live for because he had more to die for. And because Paul had more to die for, he had everything to live for. Paul also said, basically through this statement, that he says, to live for Christ right now is to have the most Christ possible right now. But to die in Christ is to have all the Christ possible. There is somewhat a paradox in the Christian life, isn't it? You know, I guess really because uh, the Lord, if he didn't have a purpose for us to stay back here just like he had for Paul at that point in his life, when we got saved, he'd take us on to heaven then, which is the best. Isaiah said it's a place so wonderful that when we get there, we won't even think about our earthly life. But you see, God's left us behind because he has a purpose for our life. And that's what we're going to get to today as we think about that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. There are four things I want you to see today in this message that I've titled Living the Resurrection Life. That's sometimes how it was referred to in the scripture. Living the resurrection life. Christ is alive. And because he's alive, we need to live the resurrection life. If you do that, you've got to know the person of Christ. You've got to know the power of Christ. You've got to know the passion of Christ, and you've got to know the purpose of Christ. You see, I've told people the reason I preach the way that I preach is because I believe that Jesus is coming again. And you see, there's going to be a difference between the first time Jesus came and the next time he comes. You see, the first time he came, he entered by a woman's womb and no one saw him enter. The next time he comes, every eye shall see him. The first time he came as a lamb. The next time he is coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. The first time he came to redeem, the next time he is coming to reign. The first time he came to die, the next time he is coming to raise the dead, the dead in Christ. The first time men ask, where is he who is born king of the Jews? The next time he is coming as the king of kings. The first time he got a crown of thorns. The next time he will get a crown of glory and of gold. The first time he came in poverty to a stable, but the next time he is coming in power. The first time he had an escort of angels, the next time he cometh with 10,000 of his saints. Guess what? If you're saved, we're coming with him. Amen? The first time he came in meekness, the next time he is coming in majesty. But for those of you who were a part of our Bible conference this past week that dealt with prophecy, you know so well there's something else that will happen on the timetable of God's prophecy before Jesus comes back the second time. Jesus is going to call his church home. It's called the rapture. And the reason I preach the way I do and take some of the criticism I take is because I believe in the rapture. And I believe that Jesus wants everybody to be saved. And there are going to be seven years of tribulation on this earth unequaled and unparalleled to anything. Hurricane Katrina, 9-11, the tsunami, there will be nothing 
As over and over again, 21 judgments will come upon the earth that are just intensified many times over anything that we've ever experienced. You might say, how could a God do that? He's dealing with sin for the final time, and he's given Israel a chance to repent and be saved. Amen? Now, if you want to know the expert on prophecy, this is the guy right here. He sat down in my office last week and amazed me with some things he was telling me. But you know what is a key part of prophecy right now? What nation went away for a bunch of years? We didn't think much about them. Now they're in the forefront. Iran. Ezekiel chapters 37 and 38. Iran has to come back to power and be a major threat before the rapture of the church. Now, why the rapture of the church? Well, the Lord's going to get us out of the way. You know, people can still be saved during the tribulation, but I want to tell you, if you won't be saved in this day of grace, when thousands of worship services are going on today and go on every Sunday and throughout the week, I want to tell you, you're not going to be saved, most likely, after the rapture. When you have to receive a mark on your forehead or on your hand that you won't even be able to get groceries, we used to think that was far out. That was science fiction until now. I remember if you used to go to a swimming pool and you wanted to go out of the gates, they'd put this little stamp on you that you couldn't see. And some of you probably know if you've gone to bars and things like that too, they do the same thing. And so you'd go out and you couldn't even see that mark on your hand. But when you would come back, you'd put it under this particular light and it would show that you had that mark. So everything's pretty much in place. I told you I'm no longer looking for the signs of His coming. I'm listening for the sound of His coming. When with a shout, He's going to call and audibly we'll hear it if you're saved. Assuredly, it will happen because it says so in 1 Thessalonians 4, by the word of the Lord, authoritatively it will happen because it's by the word of the Lord. Specifically, we will respond to it if you've been saved. Spontaneously and simultaneously, we will move from here to there to meet the Lord in the air. Visibly, we will see Him, and victoriously, we will reign forever with Him. It's going to happen. But you see, we need to be doing something about the reason God has left us here on this earth until that does happen. If you've got the King James Version, read it with me. I just love the way it flows. Chapter 3, verse 10 again. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Say it again with me. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now, for, folks, before you can know him, you need to know the person, Jesus Christ. I'm going to say some things to you today, and you're going to say, Brother Bobby, that's so simple, anybody knows it. But a lot of people don't, because they've never come to know Jesus personally. You see, what do you have to do to really get to know somebody? Well, I know a lot about people, or at least I think I do. I can, uh, you know, look at someone's biography, you can watch it on television, you can uh, see people and think you know a lot about somebody. But a lot of times you don't know much about those people at all. There are a lot of things we don't know about them. A lot of times on all these Hollywood gossip shows, and every time they come on, I change the channel. I could care less about what Tom Cruise is doing. That old kook. I, I, the one thing, his Scientology is going to split hell wide open when he dies. I do pray for Tom Cruise. Boy, I loved him in the movie Taps when he was a young actor, and he, was, he played a kook in that one, you know. But anyway, I pray he'll get gloriously saved. Boy, Kirk Cameron, isn't that something that young man now has been saved? And when he got saved, he used to tell them on that program, they were having scenes where he and his girlfriend were going to go a little too far before marriage. He said, I will not do it after he got saved. Boy, if more Hollywood stars got saved, we could clean up this moral cesspool that's coming out of Hollywood and coming on our television programs. I have a name for this program, Desperate Housewives. I call it Desperate Bimbos. And you know the sad part about it? it? It takes Christians in this country to make a program like that, number one. Because there's so, at least 60 million claim to be saved. So that means a bunch of Christians go home and watch Desperate Bimbos every Sunday night or whenever it's on and have made that a number one show. Boy, those women... 
pardon the term, are screwed up. And so are all the men who want to be involved with them. But it has become like, I mean, a cult, the following of people. Everybody wants to identify with one of those women. And thank God my wife doesn't identify with any of them. And I hope your wife doesn't either. All right, I got to meddling. Let's get on with this message. But to know somebody, you must meet them to really know them. And then you must spend time with them to truly know them. And then you must talk with them about most everything to intimately know them. And the only person of the opposite sex you need to intimately talk with about most everything is your husband or wife. So don't take that too far. Now, there are going to be men who are going to talk about things with men that you just don't talk about with women. I've told people the way I counsel with a lady who comes to my office is sometimes much different than a man. I try to talk to a man who comes to my office. Men just talk different, and we talk stronger. And I try to talk with a man like a man ought to talk to a man. But I've had men come to my office, and pardon the term, they go out. Well, I'm, I, I'm not going to go there anyway. But they don't act like men. The way they leave and the way they go crying and whining about stuff. But you see, men... We talk to each other differently, and ladies talk to each other differently. And I believe God meant for it to be that way. But you see, I was thinking about Brother Billy Smith. When he came to my home church, I had moved back. To, I'd, re I'd resigned from a church where I was full-time minister of youth because I felt called to finish up my seminary. I had about 60 hours transferring where I did in Mid-America, 30 hours, didn't transfer. So I knew I had at least two years ahead of me. And I'd been going part-time for four years. Well, that first year was pretty tough, and we learned to live by faith and took a 90% pay cut in salary and all. And during that time, my pastor, 26 years, uh, we went back to my home church. He retired. One thing he did before he left, he got me on at least semi-full-time as uh, director of singles. But then they formed a pastor search committee. My dad was on that pastor search committee, and there were a lot of good people on it. And I remember Saturday after Saturday going down to our church. I said, why do we have to do it at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock on Saturday? Can't we set it a little later? But you know how these older people are. They like to get up early. So, I mean, I would get up early and, and go down there. My brother was chairman of the deacons or had been. And my dad and many of those pastor search committee people would be there. And we'd get at our prayer altar on Saturdays. And we'd pray for God's man. And we believe God sent us his man. But to be perfectly honest, they're just people who didn't want to hear the preaching of the Word of God. They didn't want to hear, thus saith the Lord. And so people, here's what they did. They wouldn't ever get to know the new pastor. Some people who had stabbed Brother Cope, the previous pastor, and his back over and over again, all of a sudden they were going up to him and just slobbering all over him the way they were acting toward him all of a sudden. And I was, you know, I want to say, you hypocrites. Why are you, why are you doing it now? But see, a man came in, even more so, Brother Coke went to Bob Jones, so you know he was conservative, amen. <laughs> Matter of fact, he was the only man I ever knew who voted for Barry Goldwater. That's how conservative he was. He grew up in Phoenix and Arizona, so he knew of Goldwater. I told you, up, and, up until I found out he voted for Goldwater, I didn't know anybody who, who voted for Barry Goldwater. But Brother Coke was pretty conservative, then Billy Smith came in, and y'all heard how he preached last week. Boy, Wednesday night, you need to get a copy of that message, and I promise you, I didn't set him up. I didn't tell him one thing about our church or about anything, about anything going on, and boy, he hit some stuff. He stepped on some toes the other night. But I remember there were some, you could just hear the undermining and some things going on in the church there. After in one year, we had five, over 500 additions, baptized 135 people, and it was starting to be the same way again. And there are some people who could care less about lost souls getting saved. You know what one of the biggest deals was? There was this group, their Sunday school class had grown to about 100 because of a Sunday school class from another church that went through a split. Forty of them came over and all wanted to stay together. So all of a sudden you got this big class, they were called the Sweet Spirit class. I used to call them the Quench the Spirit class. Because they thought they were more important than the rest of the church. And one of the things that happened at that point in church growth, 
When you got a certain size as a Sunday school class, you were to divide and start new units out of that. That was the plan that was going across the board on how to grow a Sunday school. And it worked. But man, they didn't like it. They didn't want to split their class. And so these little things began to go through. And I remember I was over the singles and we had five single adult Sunday school classes. And then, the, then I had, they put the college under me. And so there were three couples or four couples that helped out the college. One of those couples was kind of siding with this other group. So I went up to a guy one day who I'd known a long time. And I just asked him, I said, what, what, what's the deal here? And I'm that boy, he bristled up. Well, Bobby, people just perceive that Brother Billy doesn't love them. Here's what I asked him. How many of those people have spent a minute with him? They're sitting back there on their blessed assurances and making judgments about a man they don't know. But see, they perceive it so they don't really know the truth. 